G'day and welcome to the second session of the Foundations course. In the first session, I talked about God being love. God is love. And I'd like to revisit that just in a way because I want to link the character of God and his nature. So the character of God is that he is love. And the nature of God is like, who is he? How does he, in what form is he? A lot of people believe in a Unitarian God, and I must admit a Unitarian God is easy to believe in, a singularity, God, the one who just does everything. Christianity teaches the Trinity of God, and that actually leads beautifully to the idea of God being love. You see, in eternity past, before anything was created, God existed, and because he existed in the form of Trinity, he was able, or since forever, to exist in, an, in, in a self-giving manner into that Trinity of, of himself, different persons of the Godhead. Otherwise, the Unitarians have to admit that God had to learn love. God only began to love uh, when he created angels or created humanity or created the animals or something. And therefore God realized that he was a God of love. If we believe that God is all wise and all powerful, uh, we have to admit that he's always loved. I think that's an interesting philosophical uh, example that supports the revelation of scripture. And today we sort of move from that where we say in this love, this eternal love in the Godhead, he began to express that in a very unique way in the creation that we see around us and in our own lives. And so first of all, I'd like us to look at a scripture from Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, chapter one, uh, the first part of verse 26 and then verse 27. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. How beautiful is this in the first page of scripture for this unique grammar to start coming out. Let us, God said, let us make man in our image. And then in, in, almost in the same breath, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. When scripture refers to man, it's mankind. It's humanity. Humans, man and woman, are created in the image of God. This is the outworking of the eternal God uh, to be able to love and image bearers, not just animals that, that move and do their thing and then die, but a unique creation made in God's image. This is a very important thing. Every person you lock eyes with in this world, no matter what they've done, no matter who they are, they have been created in God's image. This is the revelation of Scripture. It's a beautiful revelation, and I believe that there are, well, at least six implications. There's probably many implications. I guess the first, to me, is the ability to communicate with God it makes us distinct from the animals. Whether you communicate with God or not is not really the point. There's something in humanity from as far back as we can remember of people wanting to engage with the divine. And this, there's such vast ideas of what that looks like. But if we just boil it all down, there's something inside the human psyche, the human soul that wants to, cre wants to communicate with the creator. Secondly, people have a moral framework and this is different from the animals and we sort of know that we know that 
when a great white shark kills some other sea creature, or you see those David Attenborough uh, examples of the killer whales that throw the seals up and play with them and then eat them, you know, um, while it's sort of mm, strange, or a cheetah chasing down some animal. It's not murdering, it's just killing. But for humans, we have this moral framework, and I think it's a good pointer to us being made in God's image. We have this sense of right and wrong and good and bad. There are, there are things that we discern, no, that's not good. And, and, and that's bad. Why do we have that? And we have this sort of sense of obligations to our duties. What is the right way of doing it? What is the wrong way of doing things? I'm going to talk about more of that in the next session. But we have this moral framework. Thirdly, I would say that humans are creative, whereas animals are not. And while it's true that there are elef elephants in Thailand that paint with their paintbrushes in their trunk, that there's nothing, nothing can compare to the majesty of humanity's creativity, our ability to uh, design music and create musical instruments and then create symphonies where musical instruments and people are just brought together to create this uh, a beautiful uh, sound. Uh, paintings and literature, uh, architecture, I mean, uh, it's phenomenal. The things, if technology, for example, the creativity is a marker, I believe, and scripture would bear out that it's a marker of God's imprint on us. Fourthly, I'd say sacrificial love. Humans have an ability to give up their lives for other people, even people that they don't know. And it's true, again, that in the animal kingdom there are examples of the mothering chicken that protects its young and then dies. Um, incredible things, it's true. But again, there's a consciousness in humanity that is, a, is deliberate in things. It's not just instinct to protect the young. There's something further than that. Fifthly, I'd say, in line with that, is the ability to choose against instinct. Now, if you put a plate of food in front of an animal that's hungry, it will eat the food. Of course, if you put <coughs> a plate of food in front of humans, they'll probably eat it too if they're hungry. But here's the difference. Humans have the ability to withhold that food. People fast for different reasons, maybe political reasons, maybe religious reasons. We say, no, I don't need that. I'm not having that. And animals are not able to do that. And not only food, but all the instincts of, sure, we share uh, certain body structures of animals. And that's how God designed it. So we do have instincts, but we have the ability to be able to uh, move within those instincts, withhold those instincts, according to, number two, our moral framework. It's fascinating. And sixthly, I think that one thing that sets us apart, this may be controversial, is that we are everlasting. You see, one of the markers that God has placed on humans in designing us is that he imparted into us immortality. We are not like the animals that die and then just cease to exist. Scripture bears out that there's an eternal, not an eternal, an everlasting. Eternal means no beginning. <laughs> we certainly had a beginning. An everlasting um, component to us. And this is why salvation is so precious and the rescue is so powerful, which we will eventually get into. Because this everlasting nature, what, what happens when people go against God's moral framework? How does God deal with everlasting creatures that he loves, but who don't want him, who want to live for themselves? We'll talk about that more in the future, but uh, just as a way of summing up, 
the three three things that really undergird what it means to be human, what it means to be made in God's image, is that life for humans is brimming with purpose, meaning, and value. And that makes us distinct from the animals. And that is the sort of thing that you'll find as you open the scriptures. That is the sort of thing that you experience when you interact in life. You know, you will see these beautiful six things in fallen humanity. You will hear a pop singer singing beautifully, but their lifestyle is just so corrupted. How can that be? It's because they've got the mark of God on them. There's a creativity in them. You'll see great abilities of self-sacrifice, in, perhaps in times of war or conflict, or even at the moment with the coronavirus and the, the medics that are out there on the front lines, uh, risking in, in a lot of ways being contaminated, being infected. Why? There's something of sacrificial love within humanity. So God bless you. I um, encourage you to explore the scriptures and ponder this part of who we are and who the people are that you lock eyes with, how precious they must be in God's sight. God bless you.